Hi guys, I hope everyone is staying safe. I know you're all probably experts in social distancing by now. Welcome to your final student-led presentation. Today, Rob and I are gonna be going over some non-parametric testing. The main takeaways from this video are gonna be why we have non-parametric tests, when we use them, how the underlying ranking system works. The system applies to most, but not all of the tests we're gonna be looking at today, and how to execute and analyze these tests. Here's a quick summary table of the parametric tests that we've covered throughout the course so far, presented on the left side, and on the right side is their non-parametric alternative. Why do we even have non-parametric tests to begin with? Well, non-parametric tests don't have as many demanding assumptions for the data that we see with parametric tests, the biggest one being that the data does not need to be normally distributed. They're also pretty useful when you have a very small sample size, although Palant does not indicate a threshold for what a very small sample size is. But non-parametric tests are not without its faults. They are less sensitive compared to their parametric counterparts, meaning they may fail to detect differences between groups that might actually exist. Overall, if you can, meaning if your data meet the appropriate assumptions, always opt for the parametric test. There are general assumptions that apply to all the tests that we're going to be talking about today. The first is that the sample must be randomly selected. And secondly, that the observations are independent, meaning that each subject is only accounted for one time and that the data from one subject does not influence the data from another. There is an exception to this assumption, and that is it is not required for tests that look at repeated measures. So that would be the Wilcoxon signed rank tests and the Friedman tests that we'll be looking at today. As we are covering six different types of non-parametric tests today, for your convenience, we have merged all of the different files um, or data sets into a single file that can be downloaded from OnCue. So feel free to open that now so that you're, you'll have it ready to go to follow along during the SPSS parts that are coming up shortly. First on our list of six is the chi-square test. The chi-square test has no parametric alternative and there are two different types. We have the goodness of fit test and the test for independence. The goodness of fit test essentially tells us if the sample data represents the data that we would expect to see from the actual population, whereas the test for independence tells us if two categorical variables are related to each other. The test for independence is much more widely used than the goodness of fit test, and thus will be the type of chi-square test we will be focusing on today. What a chi-square test for independence does is it compares the frequency of cases in different categories from one variable across the different categories of another variable. So this test needs two categorical variables, each with at least two categories within them. To help us visualize this, we have an example research question, which is, is there a relationship between sex and smoking? We can see we have two categorical variables, both with two categories each. This is an example of a classic two by two setup. And here's what I mean by two by two. We have two categorical variables, sex and smoking, and both of those have two categories. It's important to know that you do not have to have a two by two setup for a chi-square test. You can have two categorical variables. In fact, you must have two categorical variables, but each of them can have more than two categories. So you could have a two by three setup, a three by three setup, or any other variation. There's only one additional assumption for chi-square tests on top of the two general assumptions that we talked about earlier. And this is the assumption of the lowest expected frequency. Expected frequency is basically how many times you expect to get something. In the case of our example, if the chances of being a smoker is 30% and you sample 200 people, how many of those people are gonna be smokers? So at least 80% of cells should have an expected frequency of at least five. And if you violate this assumption, you're at risk of a type one error. This assumption is even stricter with two by two setups, which require a minimum frequency of at least 10. So now we're gonna head over to SPSS to learn how to run a chi-square test for independence. So you'll notice we'll have quite a few variables here. It's because we have all the variables for all six non-parametric tests that we're gonna be running today. To run a chi-square test, you're gonna to go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, and then you're gonna click on Cross Tabs. We're gonna move the categorical independent variable, so sex, and you notice there's two, but I've labeled the one for the chi-square tests um, for the chi-square. 
then you're going to move that into rows, and then you're going to move the dependent categorical variable into the column section. We're going to go click on statistics, and we're going to make sure that we check off our chi-square tests and hit continue. And then we're going to go to cells, and we're going to make sure we check off expected. And then under the percentages box, we're going to check off row, column, and total. Go ahead and click continue, and that's about it. So you can go ahead and paste into your syntax, or you can go click OK, and this is what your output is going to look like. The box you're going to want to look at is the chi-square test box. First, we're going to check the lowest expected frequency assumption, which is 35.87, which is well above the minimum value of 10 that is required for a 2x2 two two setup like ours. And when you have a 2x2 two two setup, you want to look at the continuity correction. So we get a chi-square statistic of 0.337 and a p-value of 0.56 which is greater than the significance threshold of 0.05, so it's not significant. And if you have a setup that is not a 2x2 two two configuration, you're going to want to look at the Pearson chi-square statistic. Overall, this table is telling us that there is no significant difference between the proportion of female smokers to the proportion of male smokers. And here is an example of how you would present the data. All right, the second test we're going to be looking at today is the Mann Whitney U test. The Man Whitney U test is a non-parametric alternative for an independent t-test. Therefore, it also compares two different groups, but instead of comparing means like what a t-test does, it compares the medians of each group instead. To be able to run a Man Whitney U test, there needs to be one categorical independent variable with two groups and one continuous dependent variable. The example research question that we are going to be exploring for this test is do males and females differ in terms of their relative maximal oxygen consumption, otherwise known as VO2 peak. So we have our categorical independent variable with two groups, female and male, and we have our continuous dependent variable, which is VO2 peak measured in milliliters per kilogram body weight per minute. There are no additional assumptions for this test. Remember that the general assumptions for all non-parametric tests still apply. So the way the Man whitney u test works is that it starts by ranking the dependent variable. The lowest value is given a rank of 1, the second lowest value is given a rank of 2, and so on. And here on the right we just have the values rearranged in descending order. So here we have the VO2 peaks ranked in order. The green represents the females, while the yellow represents the males. What a Man whitney u test does for each group is it takes the sum of the ranks and also the averages. The sum of ranks is used to calculate the U statistic. Luckily, the SPSS output will provide you with that statistic and you won't have to calculate it yourself. The U statistic tells us how much overlap there is between the ranks of both groups. It also paints us a picture for each group. The larger the sum means that the group had a greater number of higher ordered ranks. If we look at a scale of the continuous dependent variable, so VO2 peak, and let's say in one scenario, after ranking the VO2 peaks of females and males, we find there's a pretty large overlap, meaning that there are quite a few males who achieve a higher VO2 peak than some of the females. So in this case, we have a pretty large U statistic. In another scenario, where there aren't as many males who achieve a higher VO2 peak than some females, there is less overlap, and thus a smaller U statistic. A third scenario is also possible, where there is no overlap between the two groups, and in this case, the U statistic equals zero. Essentially, the larger the U statistic, the smaller the difference between the group is. And the smaller the U statistic, the bigger the difference between the group is. This is actually opposite of the T statistic, so keep that in mind. Now we're going to head over to SPSS to learn one of the two ways to run a Man Whitney U test. The first method is a method outlined in Palant's guide. Um, surprisingly, the SPSS output for any of the Man Whitney U methods does not give us the median, which is what we're comparing. Um, so first off, we need to go get that information. So we'll go to Analyze, we'll go to Descriptive Statistics, and hit Frequencies. You're going to put the dependent variable, so VO2 peak pre, and we're going to hit statistics and we're going to ask for the median. We'll hit continue and we'll hit OK. And that'll give you the median for that variable right there. Now we're going to go ahead and run the Man Whitney U test. So we'll go to analyze. We'll go to non-parametric tests. We're going to go to legacy dialogues and then two independent samples. 
you're going to move your dependent variable, so VO2 peak, into the test variable list. And you're going to move your categorical independent variable, um, so the sex for the man Whitney U test here, into the grouping variable. And then you're going to want to define those groups. And we're going to make sure the man Whitney U test is clicked. And you can go to options and also ask for descriptives as well. We're going to hit OK. And that's going to give us these tables right here. From the output, this is the table that you're going to want to look at. There are three key pieces of information that you'll need from here. The first is our use statistic, which is important for reporting, but it doesn't tell you much on its own. We will also need the z-score, which we use to calculate effect size. You'll notice that there are two different p-values. The asymptomatic p-value, which is used with sample sizes equal to or greater than 50. And then there's the exact p-value, and that is used when your sample size is less than 50. Now we're going to head over to SPSS to learn a second way to run this Man Whitney U test. All right, so we're going to run our second method now that isn't outlined in Plans Guide. We're of course going to go to Analyze Non-Parametric Tests, and then we're going to go to Independent Samples. You're going to get this box, which looks a little bit different than what we're used to. We're going to completely skip this. We're going to go to Fields. You're going to put your dependent variable in the test field and your independent variable in the groups field and you don't need to go and define your groups here. We're going to head over to settings, you're going to click customize tests, we're going to click the man Whitney U test and then you're going to keep everything else the same so just under test options you have your significance level of 0.5, your confidence intervals of 95 um, and we're just going to keep everything the same. You can paste it or you can run it you're going to get this kind of output, which is a little bit different than what we're used to. Um, and there's actually more information here. If you go ahead and double click that table, you'll get this right here. Um, and sometimes when you have more than one group, you can go ahead and play with these boxes down here. But because we don't have too many groups, um, there aren't too many options. So you can go and view your continuous information. Um, see how that information is distributed and stuff like that. This is the initial output you're going to see and it's going to look a little bit different than what we're used to. What's really nice about this output is that it writes the null hypothesis for you. In this case, the null hypothesis is the distribution of VO2 peak is the same between females and males. It tells us the p-value and whether or not you reject or accept the null hypothesis. This diagram is kind of like the Venn diagram schematic that we looked at earlier to explain the theory of the use statistic. One side or one color represents one group. So in this case, the blue side is the females and the green side is the males. We see there's a pretty good symmetry, which is an indication that both groups are pretty similar um, and that there is likely not a big difference between the two groups. On the right side, we have a table that is produced through this second method, which essentially tells us the exact same thing as method one did. So we have our U statistic, our Z-score, and both of our p-values. We can calculate effect size using the Z-score produced from the SPSS output. The variable N is the sample size. So we, we plug in both of those values, we get an absolute effect size of 0.23. And this is an example of how you would go about reporting that information. All right, guys, we're reaching the halfway mark here. We're on to our third test, the Wilcox and Signed Rank Test. So this test is an alternative for a paired sample t test. So it also converts scores into rank. And what it does is it compares ranks from time one to time two or condition one compared to condition two. This means that you can also use this test in a match subject design. For this test, you need a continuous dependent variable that is measured on the same sample at two different time points or in two different conditions. There is no additional assumptions other than the general ones that we discussed earlier. The example research question for the data we're going to be looking at for this test is, is there a change in relative maximal oxygen consumption following a six-week low perfusion pressure training period? We have our continuous dependent variable, which is VO2 peak or max oxygen consumption. And it's measured at two different time points before and after a six week training program. So the ranking system for the Wilcox and signed rank test can be a little more confusing. The key takeaway is that we are ranking the differences between time one and time two. 
So the null hypothesis for Wilcox and rank tests is that the median of differences is zero. Another way to think about this is that if the absolute sum of the ranks of the increases, so if the changes in increase or decrease, the absolute sum of the ranks of the increases and decreases are the same, and the alternative hypothesis is that the sum of the increases and decreases are not the same. Because we have 10 subjects in this example, the total sum of ranks is 55. So the null hypothesis would be that half of those people would see an increase and half of those people would see a decrease in VO2 peak of the same magnitude. So half of 55 is 27.5. So that's where we get that number from. Fortunately, our differences in this example are all positive here, but the sign of the differences does matter and we'll talk about that soon. The lowest difference receives a rank of 1, and in this case, the highest difference receives a rank of 10. So we rank the differences based on absolute value, but the sign of the differences are important here. Um, if the difference is negative, the rank is also negative. This particular example can help us visualize the alternative hypothesis where clearly the sum of the positive ranks, the pink ones, does not equal the sum of the negative ranks, the red ones. So what we do if the differences are the same, building on the same example we're using, if I change that second difference, that second value, to be the same as the first one, what we would do is we would take the average rank of the two and give both differences that average rank. Notice that the negative difference still has a negative rank. So now we're gonna head over to SPSS to learn one of the two ways to run a Wilcoxon signed rank test as outlined in Palance Guide. So just like the Man Whitney U test, you'll need to go get your median values first. Um, and then after that, we can go into this first method. Um, for the Wilcoxon signed rank test, and this method is the one that is outlined in Palance Guide. So you'll go to Analyze, you'll go to Non-Parametric Tests, Legacy Dialogues, and then click on Two Related Samples. Here you're going to move both of your dependent variables, so here we have pre and post um, training, VO2 peaks, and we're going to move that into our test pairs. Um, Wilcoxon is already um, clicked on so you're good there. We'll go to options and we'll get our descriptives too. You'll hit continue and then you can paste or hit OK and this is the output that you're gonna get. This is the table of interest. Again we have a z-score and a p-value but this method is actually missing some data. The second method for running the test through SPSS is essentially the same as the second method for the Man Whitney U test, but it provides us with a lot more information, so I would suggest using this method instead. All right, so for the second method, we are going to go to Analyze, Non-Parametric Tests, Related Samples. You're going to get this box again. We're going to go to Fields. We're going to move both of our dependent variables into the Fields tests. Then you're going to go to settings, we're going to customize our tests, and we're going to click the Wilcoxon match paired signed rank test. And everything else can stay the same. Um, so you can go and paste it or run it. So we're going to run it. We've got the same looking output here, and you'll give that a double click as well. And we've got more information here. So here we have the same thing as before. We have our null hypothesis, our p-value, and whether or not we reject or accept the null. In this case, we rejected our null hypothesis, meaning that the median of differences between before and after training does not equal zero. Here on the left, we can see a visual representation of the differences between pre and post training. On the right, we have our t-statistic, our z-score, which we need to calculate effect size, and our p-value. So we calculate effect size the exact same way as we did before. We end up with a very large effect size of 0.89. And this is how you would go about reporting a Wilcoxon signed rank test. All right, everybody, so we're going to keep it going right now with the rest of our non-parametric tests, the first of which is going to be the Kruskal-Wallis test. Now, what this is, is that it's an alternative for the one-way between group ANOVA. Uh, so once again, as Taylor said, all of these tests are non-parametric alternatives, and so what they can do is they can kind of work around that assumption of normal data. So if, you, if your underlying data isn't normal, these tests are here to allow you to actually run these comparisons. 
And so specifically for this test, you'd use it when you want to compare the scores of one continuous variable between three or more groups. And so we saw earlier that t-tests are used when you want to compare between two groups, but if there's more groups that you want to compare between, that's when you're using this uh, Kruskal-Wallis test. <clears throat> so moving forward, uh, what types of data do you need for this test? So just like a regular ANOVA, you need one categorical independent variable. So this is something where your participants can be grouped and you need one continuous dependent variable. So that's something that can be measured on a scale. Uh, and then with that, there's no additional assumptions needed for this test except for those that were noted earlier. So here's our question. Let's jump right into it. Let's do a Kruskal Wallace test. So because I'm in biomechanics, we're gonna look at jumping. So how does jump height change across three levels of sedentarism? Very simple question, let's explore. Here's our data. So you can see on the left here, we have sedentary groups broken down into one, two, and three. This is low, uh, sorry, high sedentary, medium sedentary, and low sedentary, uh, respectively. So number one is the least physically active, number three are the most physically active. And on the right, we have our jump height values measured in centimeters on a continuous scale, that's our dependent variable. So what does this test actually do? So we know what ANOVA does, we've looked through that. Now we can understand what this non-parametric non alternative does. So what it's doing is it's taking all the participants' dependent var variable values, or those jump heights, and giving them a rank. Now, as we saw before, this rank is just how does this value relate to all the other values in our data set? Is it on the low end? Is it on the high end? Where does it sit? And these ranks are averaged within the groups. And so I'm going to show you how it does that. And then using a specific test, these mean ranks within the groups are compared between groups. So this is how it does that. So we can see here, I've given a rank to all these jump height values. So 10 being the lowest, it gets a score of one. Uh, 12 being kind of the middle score, it's gonna get a score of three. And then 25 being the highest score, it's gonna get this score of six. So what this test is doing is because we are broken it down into groups here of participants, it's also gonna break these ranks into groups. And so groups of two here based on that sedentary group variable and then it's gonna average these ranks to create an average rank for the specific group. Now, these mean ranks are then being put into this test variable to try and see if there's a significant difference between these groups. So instead of using these raw jump height values, they're now converting it into ranks and using those instead. And we're gonna do that in SPSS now. So we're gonna move back to SPSS uh, we're going to see that here we have our sedentary group variable and our jump height variable. You should also have these. To do the Kruskal Wallace test, we're going to go to analyze and then non parametric tests, legacy dialogues, and then K independent samples. We're going to put in our sedentary group into the grouping variable, define its range, which is from one to three. And then we're going to put in jump height into our test variable and we're gonna make sure that the Kruskal Wallace H test is checked here, and then we're gonna press OK. So when you do that, you're gonna get a certain test output, and that's what that's gonna, this is what that's gonna look like. So it's gonna give you those ranks that we just calculated before, and it's also gonna give you the test statistics. So in this case, we have our Kruskal Wallace H test, which is kind of um, analogous to a chi-squared test. It's, uh, it has the same distribution as a chi-squared test. Uh, we have our degrees of freedom and we have our significance value. So once again, if we define our alpha as 0 0.05, then because this value is greater than 0 0.05, we can say that there's no significant difference in jump height between these groups. And that's what we're going to do in the interpretation. So when we're writing that out, uh, we have here that a Kruskal Wallace H test showed that there were no statistically significant differences in jump heights between the different sedentary groups. You give the test statistic, you give uh, the degrees of freedom and then the total number of participants. Uh, then you give the test statistic value and the p-value. And then you can also include what mean ranks were present in each of these groups. Now the next test we're gonna do is the Friedman test. So what the Friedman test is, it's a alternative for the repeated measures ANOVA. So this is when you're comparing scores within one sample across multiple time points or uh, multiple conditions. So in this case, uh, what we're gonna need is we're gonna need one continuous measure. Uh, so this is 
a something that is measured on a scale and this is measured from the sample at all these different time points or in, under, under these different conditions. Now additionally just like the last one there's no extra assumptions that you need for this test it's only the ones that we've noted earlier on in the presentation. So here's our example research question. We have how does perception of joy which is measured on this continuous scale change across the teenage lifespan? Uh, and that teenage lifespan in this study was defined as T1 being 13 years old, T2 being 16 years old, and T3 being 19 years old. So what happened here is that there was a sample of participants. They were measured when they were 13 years old, and then three years later they were measured, and three years after that they were measured again to see how this perception of joy is changing across this lifespan. So here is that typical or here is that example data. So we have three participants here and we have their joy values at time one, time two, and time three. So just like the Kruskal Wallace test, let's see how the Friedman test does an alternative repeated measures ANOVA. So using that rank system, one participant's specific dis, uh, dependent variable values, now these are the ones uh, in the rows, are given a rank across time points for conditions. So these ranks these values are being ranked across the rows. Then after that, the mean rank of a single time point is calculated. So that means the mean rank of a column is calculated. Now we're going to go through this later. After that, the test is run based on these mean ranks uh, and compared between each time point or each condition. So here's how that works. So I've split the data here into the three participants. And we're now going to rank across the rows. And so we have one, two, and three. So because that is escalating in uh, how high those values are, those ranks are also going to be one, two, and three across the row. We do the same thing for the next two rows or participants. And then after that, the individual ranks in the columns are averaged out. So first off, we're ranking the values in the rows and then we're calculating a mean rank based on the time point or the column. So that results in mean ranks of 1.3, 2.0, and 2.7 here. Now once again, these are the values that are being put into this test, not those raw variable values. So we're gonna go into SPSS now and we're going to do this Friedman test. So we, you see here, participant one, two, and three with their three time points of data. We're going to analyze non-parametric tests, legacy dialogues, k-related samples, and then we're going to put in, let me reset this, we're going to put in three joy values into this test variable. Don't need to do anything else, just make sure that Friedman is clicked and press OK. Once that's done, you're going to get an output just like we did before on these mean ranks and the test statistic. So same exact thing, you have our number of participants, uh, we have our chi-squared value, our degrees of freedom, and our significance. And here's how to interpret it. So in this case, there was no statistically significant difference in joy across the teenage lifespan. You then give your chi-squared value, your uh, conditions, sorry, your degrees of freedom, then your number of participants, the test value, and the significance value. Now in the case that a significant value was found, what you would do in this case was you would do a post hoc analysis using our previously explored Wilcoxon signed rank test. So you'd go back earlier in this presentation, perform that test, uh, and that's how you would do these post hoc comparisons on these different time points. Now with that, you would also put in a Bonferroni correction and we've gone over that before as well. Uh, Great, and so the last test we're gonna to run today is the Spearman rank order correlation. So what's happening here is this is the alternative for the Pearson's R correlation coefficient. Now there is also another alternative here, it's called Kendall's tau, but because of time, I won't be exploring that relationship here, uh, in the, or that test here in this lecture. Instead, it is gonna be in your SPSS uh, guide for how to perform these non-parametric tests and you can find it, I believe, in Field's book. Field speaks about Kendall's tau. Uh, but when it comes to the Spearman rank order correlation, what this test is used for is it's used to measure the strength and direction of a monotonic relationship between two continuous variables. So now this happens, so 
A Pearson correlation is used to measure a linear relationship, whereas a Spearman correlation is used to measure a monotonic relationship. So what's the difference between those two? Well, you can see here that we have three graphs. We have on the far left, we have a linear and monotonic graph. So what this is showing is that it's linear, which means that across the value of the x-axis, as the x value increases, the y value is changing in a relatively stable magnitude. And this is also happening in one direction. And so as the x value increases, the y value is decreasing. Now it's also a linear and monotonic relationship could be the other way. You could have an x value increase with a y value increase as well. Now this middle graph is nonlinear because at this point here, a small variation in the x is gonna change a lot in the y value. But down here, a small, a small change in the x is also going to small, create a small change in the y. So this is nonlinear. It's showing an exponential curve. But this is monotonic, because monotonic means that there's a single relationship that exists between these variables. So as x increases, y is going to increase as well. You can also have another monotonic relationship, which is as x increases, y decreases. It's not really worrying about the magnitude of how much this is happening, just that overall relationship. And this is matched here in this non-monotonic graph. So you can see at this middle point, if the x values keep increasing here, the y values start to decrease instead of increase. This is a non-monotonic relationship. So what do you need for this test? Very simple, you just need two continuous variables that you'd like to compare, and there's no additional assumptions other than those noted earlier. And here's our research question. So you can see here I've plotted our data. We have a uh, nonlinear but monotonic relationship here. And we're asking, is the relationship between weekly moderate to vigorous physical activity hours and VO2 max? So what does this test do? So very simply, what this test is doing is that each data point is given a rank, just like we've explored before, and a Pearson's R correlation is then performed on these ranks rather than on the raw values themselves. And just like we've interpreted before, the sign on the correlation coefficient depend, or indicates if this is a positive or a negative relationship, and the magnitude of the coefficient indicates how strong this correlation is. Uh, so we're going to, so here's our, sorry, here's our data that we're using. Uh, we have our weekly exercise hours here and our VO2 max values. And so what this uh, test is going to do is it's going to break apart that second variable and then it's going to assign ranks to that second variable and it's going to use those ranks in the correlation equation instead of those raw variables. So let's perform this test in SPSS now. Let's go back. Let's press analyze, correlate bivariate, and then we're putting in our weekly MVPA hours and our VO2 max hours in here. We're clicking off Pearson, we're clicking on to Spearman, making sure it's two-tailed and pressing OK. Now what pops out of that output is going to be this test output table. So we can see here that it's uh, displaying a correlation coefficient for the Spearman's RHO test a significance and a uh, participant number. So our correlation coefficient is 0.891, which is very high, and as such, it's also a significant correlation. And here's how we interpret that. So we have a Spearman's rank order correlation was run to determine the relationship between weekly moderate to vigorous physical activity hours and VO2 max scores. There was a strong positive correlation between the variables, which was statistically significant, and then you provide all the relevant values there. Now, the last thing we're going to go through is a non-parametric test in published research. So this is going to be a Spearman test that this is looking at. And so here we have the effect of overhead target on the lower limb biomechanics during a vertical jump, jump test in elite female athletes. Once again, I study jumping. Let's get into some jumping. So let's go into this article here. So we can see here that the purpose of the study was to investigate the effect of an overhead target on the jump height and lower limb biomechanics uh, in vertical drop jumps. So pretty much what's happening here is that this participant is standing on this block to begin. They jump off, uh, they kind of step off, and then as soon as they hit the ground, they're exploding up with as much force as they possibly can. Uh, 
And they either do that with a target here, uh, telling them to hit their head on this target, or no target here. Uh, and so those are the two conditions in this case. So we can see here that uh, just over 500 participants do this, did this study, I think. They performed all of these different tests on kinematics and kinetic relationships in these jumps. But really what we're interested here in that non-parametric mindset uh, is that we are assessing the consistency of the athlete rankings between these two tasks. So they calculated a Spearman's rank correlation coefficient uh, to test the consistency of all these kinetic and kinematic uh, data points between the non-target and target conditions. And so you can see here that this is the non-target condition, this is the target condition, and they are now, oh, computer's gonna die, let's get through this quickly. So they are creating a Spearman rank correlation coefficient for all of these different uh, conditions, for these two different conditions here. Uh, and we can see by all these values that they are positive and that they're relatively strong. So we can assume that there is high consistency um, between these two different conditions on these uh, jump variables themselves. And that's what they have here. So we observed a strong rank correlation between the two tasks. Uh, and a moderate correlation, so strong in some, moderate in others. Really what they're saying is that there is consistent uh, findings between these two conditions here. As one value increases in this non-target condition, the value is also going to increase in that target condition. And that's it for our presentation here. Uh, so that's all for us. Please explore our uh, SPSS guide on how to perform these tests if you're confused and we will see you in the discussion posts. Thanks.